Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Dystrophin Quantification in Preclinical and Clinical Settings. I am Shelley Mulock of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar has been organized by Biotechni using the LabRoots platform. During the presentation, you will hear about the use of Simple Western, the fully automated Western blotting instrument that provides quantitative protein measurements using as little as three microliters of sample in just three hours. You may have also heard of Simple Western as the capillary Western. Unlike traditional Western blotting, Simple Western does not have a gel to blot transfer step, making the technique more reproducible, especially when analyzing larger proteins such as dystrophin. In addition to being much faster than a traditional Western blot, Simple Western is more sensitive, has a larger dynamic range, and uses less sample. Recently, Simple Western was recommended for dystrophin quantification in the industry guidance submitted by the parent project Muscular Dystrophy to the FDA. To learn more about Simple Western and other solutions from Biotechni, please visit their, their website at bio-technique.com. As a reminder, today's webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education icon on the far left of your screen to obtain your credits. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, if you experience any technical uh, difficulties, you can utilize the QA box and we will assist you directly. I'd like to now cordially welcome today's speaker, Dr. Anamik Artsmaras, Professor of Translational Genetics at Leiden University Medical Center. Dr. Artsmaras aims to bridge the gap, to be, that, the gap excuse me, between stakeholders involved in drug development for rare diseases and to develop exon skipping therapies for patients with unique mutations. She has published over 230 peer reviewed papers, 11 book chapters, and 15 patents, and has given many invited lectures at scientific conferences and patent organization meetings. Dr. Artsmer Russ has received numerous awards for her contributions to the muscular dystrophy field, and we are excited to have Dr. Artsmer Russ share her insights with us today. Welcome, Dr. Artsmer Russ. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the opportunity to present here um, about dystrophin, my favorite protein. Um, before we go into the nitty gritty, my disclosures, uh, I'll give you the executive um, summary um, my uh, institute has patents on exoskipping technology, and as a co-inventor, I'm entitled to a share of royalties. Um, and anything else that I do, uh, lectures, um, advisory, ad hoc con uh, consulting, all the remuneration for that goes to LUMC. And maybe specifically for this webinar, um, I was not instructed or paid by uh, 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 Protein Simple people to present in any way on the web. So all uh, statements are my own um, and, and, and I've not been instructed to make specific statements. Um, this, the talk will focus on, as I mentioned already, my favorite protein, dystrophin. And we really learned what dystrophin did by seeing what happens when patients don't have dystrophin. Um, and the, the dystrophin gene is located on the X chromosome and that means that mainly boys are affected because they have only one X chromosome. So if that is mutated, they don't have a backup. While females generally have a functional copy um, and therefore generally are carriers and don't have symptoms. In rare cases, also females will have symptoms, but we'll focus mainly on the 99.99% the of the patients who are male. Um, and lacking dystrophin, patients suffer from progressive loss of muscle tissue and muscle function. And you can see here um, different patients and you can see them from young to old. And the very top left patient, you don't really see anything yet there, but already the second picture, you can see that when this boy gets up from the floor, he, he uses the Gower's maneuver. So he uses his hands to get up from the floor and that is due to muscle weakness. And then you can see that patients have lordosis, so they have this weird stance because 
several muscles are, are deteriorating, but not all at the same time. So what patients try to do is with the limited muscle capacity that they still have left to keep the, 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 as much function as they can. Patients generally lose um, the ability to walk before the age of 12, then also lose their uh, arm and hand function. And you can see again that patients use whatever way they can to remain, uh, maintain the ability to, for instance, self-feed. But around the age of 20, patients rely on uh, uh, help of others um, for most daily activities, including uh, uh, assisted ventilation. So the disease is very severe, and sadly, most patients die in the second to fourth decade of life due to the lack of dystrophin. So what does dystrophin do um, in healthy uh, individuals? It connects the cytoskeleton of muscle fibers to the connective tissue that surround each muscle fibers, and it also connects each fi muscle fiber to each other. Um, and it has uh, several domains. So at the end terminal, the beginning of the protein, there's two actin binding domains that bind to the cytoskeleton. And at the end of the protein, there's the dystroglycan binding domain that connects to the extracellular matrix and extracellular matrix proteins. And what you can see is that in the middle, there's 24 spectrum-like repeats and four hinge regions. So what's interesting about dystrophin is that the two crucial domains are located at the beginning and the end of the protein. Now, so what dystrophin does, it stabilizes muscle fibers during contraction. And if there's no dystrophin, then during each contraction, damage will occur. So there's chronic continuous damage that leads to chronic inflammation, scar tissue formation, impaired regeneration, and the gradual loss of muscle tissue and muscle function that I just described for the patients. So at a molecular genetic level, what goes wrong is that patients have mutations that disrupt the reading frame. Um, and you see an example here. So you see that the genetic code exon 48 to 50 is missing. And you see also that 47 doesn't fit to exon 51. So what happens then is that you're in the wrong reading frame. So the wrong amino acids will be uh, translated and often uh, uh, an early stop will, will happen. These dystrophins are not functional because only the beginning of the protein is, 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 is correctly produced. And this linker function to the extracellular matrix is lost. And this leads to the severe Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And of course, what you can then ask yourself, so what would happen if the reading frame, the genetic code, would be maintained? And I have an example here, exon 48 to 51, uh, 51 are missing. So the deletion is larger. However, you can see on the, on the graph, 47 fits to 52. So what happens here is that protein translation can continue from start to end. And normally, proteins would not be functional if part of the, 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 the domains are, are, are missing. However, because the crucial domains for dystrophin are located at the beginning and the end, and in the middle you have 24 different repeats, well, lacking a few of these repeats is not that much of a problem. These proteins are still partially functional. How do we know they're partially functional? Because they're found in Becker muscular dystrophy. And this is a less severely, uh, uh, less severely progressive muscle uh, wasting disease. So the age of onset is later and the progression is slower. Um, so based on this, we know that if you have no dystrophin at all, you have a severe Duchenne. If you have an internally deleted dystrophin, you have the less severe Becker muscular dystrophy. And I don't want to trivialize Becker because it's still a severe progressive muscle wasting disease. But if you're coming from the Duchenne angle, then it is the less severe disease. Um, what's interesting for Becker muscular dystrophy is that the dystrophin levels do not correlate with disease severity. So not all Becker patients make the same dystrophin. Depending on where they have their in-frame mutation, they can make different dystrophins. And what we know is that if you look in a group of Becker patients that all have the same in-frame mutation, then the dystrophin levels don't influence the disease severity. So whether you have 20% or 80% of the same dystrophin, that doesn't correlate with severity. There's other factors that do, but we don't really know them. We know that it's not dystrophin levels. What does influence disease severity is where the in-frame mutation is located. And that makes sense because you need specific parts of the dystrophin. So there's in-frame mutation that leads to Duchenne. 
when the, the, the domain connecting to the extracellular matrix is missing, or when all three actin binding domains are missing, then these dystrophins are not functional, even if the mutation is in frame. However, most Becker patients have a deletion that either is located in the green domain, so in the central rod domain, where we know there is redundancy, or at the beginning in the, the two actin binding domains. And you can see there's a third actin binding domain located in the middle of the central rod domain. So if there's two missing, then the third one can still result in a partially functional protein. But Becker patients with mutations at the beginning of the protein have a more severe uh, phenotype. So this is an interesting aspect of the dystrophin uh, uh, protein. Now, going back to Duchenne, the more severe um, uh, end of the, of the dystrophinopathy spectrum, given that it's caused by a lack of dystrophin, of course, restoring dystrophin would be anticipated to slow down all the pathological processes, like the impaired regeneration, the fibrosis formation, the muscle wasting. So there's work ongoing on trying to restore this. And this is gene therapy trials, so trying to add a copy of the, the gene that's not functional, axle skipping, um, stop code on read through, and genome editing. And gene therapy is in clinical trials. Axle skipping is approved in, in the US and Japan. Um, stop code on read through is approved in the, uh, the EU, but not in the US. And genome editing is still in preclinical stage. But for all these things, the goal is to restore dystrophin. And what's important to bear in mind is that except for the, the, the stop code and read-through, these approaches do not restore full-length dystrophin. So they're all based on this reading frame rule where in-frame mutations lead to Becker and out-of-frame mutations lead to Duchenne. But exoskipping, skipping, microdystrophin, and genome editing, so the gene therapy and the genome editing, none of them restores fully functional dystrophin. And this is, of course, important to bear in mind um, when you do your clinical trial and what therapeutic ex uh, effects can you expect, bearing in mind that these dystrophins are not fully functional but only partially functional. Now, briefly go over the different uh, uh, um, dystrophin restoring approaches, starting with gene therapy. So, with gene therapy, you're trying to provide a copy of the genetic code that is disrupted. And in case of Duchenne, you want to provide a copy of the dystrophin gene. However, if you want to read skeletal muscle, you need the adeno-associated virus, the AAV virus. And AAV is a very small virus. This is why it can infect skeletal muscle. But because it's small, the complete dystrophin code, genetic code, does not fit. Um, and not even the smallest Becker dystrophin that we know fits. So we had to to model it, we had to do a minimalistic design and try to develop these microdystrophin that really compare the bare necessities, the actin binding domains at the beginning, the domain at the, at the end that connects to the dystroglycan and the extracellular matrix, and then you can see three flavors of microdystrophin that are currently in clinical trials, and they either have four or five spectrums like repeat domain and two or three hinges. Um, so these are very short. They're shorter than the shortest Becker protein that we know. However, they're engineered. You can see at the bottom, you see the different spectra in the repeat. Well, they form these shapes. And of course, you can imagine if you make a transgene, you can make sure that these shapes fit together nicely. If you're doing exo skipping, or if you have Becker, or if you do the genome editing, then you, you end up with whatever the reading frame, the restored reading frame provides you with. And that's not always uh, a, a properly phased spectrum repeat domain. Now, how does exoskipping skipping work? Exoskipping skipping tries to restore the genetic code on RNA level. So the gene is transcribed, and then you have the exons coding for the protein. You have the introns not coding for the proteins. And during splicing, all the exons are linked together. If we're back to our example where exon uh, 48 to 50 is missing, we know now from the Becker patient that the deletion of exon 48 to 51 would be in frame. So what we try to do during the splicing process where all these exons are linked together is to hide one of the exons from the splicing machinery. Now, how can we do that? We can do this with small modified pieces of RNA called antisense oligonucleotides um, that bind specifically to the target exon hide it from the splicing machinery, 
splicing machinery looks for the next available axon, which in this case is axon 52. This is then connected to, in this case, 47. The reading frame is restored, and now the Shen patient can make a Becker-type protein. Um, to bear in mind, these AONs don't have the eternal life. The, the restored transcript don't have the eternal life. The Becker-like dystrophin don't have the eternal life. So this is a treatment that has to be repeated, and the currently approved compound rely on weekly intravenous injection of these AONs. The advantage of the AONs is that they're very small. So you can do systemic uh, delivery, and you don't need an AAV to deliver them. However, weekly intravenous infusion is, of course, a burden. So people are also working on genome editing. I mentioned already this is in a preclinical stage, but it uses the same trick, just targeting the DNA. Here we have a deletion of exon 52, just to underline that not everyone has the same deletion. But you can see a deletion of exon 52. You can also restore the reading frame here by skipping exon 51. And when you want to skip exon 51 on DNA level, you can use a guide RNA to cut at the acceptor splice side of this exon that is then repaired, but after double-stranded break and non-homologous end joining, the repair will um, introduce errors. And due to these errors, the splice acceptor side of exon 51 is now mutated. So exon 51 is no longer recognized by the splicing machinery. And every time a transcript is now made from this DNA, the splicing will have the restored reading frame and a Becker-type dystrophin can be made. The challenge with genome editing is that you need the genome editing tools to deliver to skeletal muscle. So you need the, the guide RNA to tell the, the, the Cas9 where to cut, and you need the Cas9 to actually do the cut. And for now, the only option to deliver this is AAV. So still in preclinical stage. Um, so each of these approaches tries to restore dystrophin, and most of them tries to restore a Becker-like dystrophin. And of course, because you try to restore dystrophin, for each of them, measuring dystrophin is important. And what's even more important, how do you measure this? And of course, the age-old question, how much dystrophin do you need? And that will be the focus of the rest of my presentation. And for those of you who were hoping to get a magic number, how much dystrophin do you need to get a magic number? Um, well, spoiler, you will not get a magic number because the problem is that how much dystrophin you need depends on different parameters. So, and these are the parameters that I will discuss so that hopefully you understand why it's not like you need 8% of dystrophin or you need 15%. It's impossible to give this, this percentage because of different things. Now we'll go over them one, one by one, starting with the distribution of expression. Um, because when we say, when I say, for instance, 10% dystrophin, what do I mean? 10% dystrophin can mean that 10% of the muscle fibers make 100% of dystrophin, or it can make, mean that all muscle fibers are each making 10% dystrophin, or anything in between. Um, so how do you measure this, and what do you measure? Well, ideally, you use a combination. So you can use the Western blot or the West system to measure the size of dystrophin and the amount. The Western blot is quantitative. But you also have to use immune fluorescence because you want to know, if you see 10% of dystrophin, you want to know how is this distributed. Do all fibers make a little bit? Do a few fibers make a lot? Um, and is the dystrophin properly located at the fiber membrane? Um, the downside side of the immune fluorescence is that the uh, the quantitation is relative, so you get a relative intensity. So you need the Western blot because that will tell, will be more accurate, accurate with with regards to um, um, quantification, but also will tell you the size. I won't go into the mass spectrometry because that just gives you the amount of dystrophin, and I think you then still need the Western blot to see the size, and you need the immune fluorescence to get all the other things. So. What I say is if you want to measure dystrophin, you want to have both. You want to have the Western blot, but you also want to see how is it distributed. Now, before showing some pictures of what this looks like, um, a consideration, because if you want to measure dystrophin in skeletal muscle, you need a muscle biopsy. And muscle biopsies 
are invasive. And I show you here a, a publication that we did uh, a couple of years ago, collaborating with patient, uh, uh, with the patient community to see what is the impact of a muscle biopsy on patients and families. Um, and well, if you want to read more, then you really have to, to go into the paper and, and read everything. But showing you here some of the, the biopsy scars, and you can imagine that this makes patients self-conscious. Um, it's, it's not a, a simple thing. These are really big scars and, 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 and uh, large amounts of muscle are removed and patients and families understand why this is needed. But of course, um, it is invasive. And especially knowing that patients have very poor regeneration, they lose a little bit of the, the, the limited amount of muscle that they have anyway. Um, what's interesting to mention is that families and patients accept the biopsies, but they especially accept them in the early stages when it's open label proof of concept. As soon as it becomes a placebo controlled clinical trials, they're less willing to undergo the biopsy because there's a risk that they have the biopsy, um, they are in placebo, and then later, maybe in an open label, they will switch to drug, but then that often would involve even an additional biopsy. Um, and of course, that's, that's one more. So another thing that's important to bear in mind is that most patients make some dystrophin. And when I started in the Duchenne field in 2000, it was clear Duchenne patients made no dystrophin and uh, Becker made some dystrophin and healthy individuals made 100% of dystrophin. What we know now that we have more sophisticated techniques is that almost all Duchenne patients make some dystrophin. And in, by immune fluorescence, and this is a picture from uh, uh, collaborators at Prozenta Biomarin, um, this picture really nicely shows that there's two types of dystrophin that patients make. You can see that all the different fibers show a little bit of green. So there's trace amounts of dystrophin, probably because there's very low level alternative splicing that corrects the reading frame. You also see these revertent fibers that are very brightly stained. These are fibers that probably um, have erosion from secondary mutation in the satellite cells. And these secondary mutation, if they restore the reading frame, then of course those satellite cells can now produce high amount of dystrophin after they've contributed to muscle repair. So both reverting fibers and trace amounts occur. How much varies for individual patients? So this means that it's not a question of one biopsy post-treatment. You, also all, all, uh, you always also need a baseline biopsy, and that makes it more invasive because you need at least two biopsies. Um, to, to see whether there's an increase in dystrophin expression after treatment. Um, so I already uh, uh, mentioned it, um, and I think for now people do the open biopsy given the scars that I just showed you, um, because if you do a needle biopsy that's less invasive, there's too little muscle tissue to do a robust immune fluorescence and Western blotting. And of course, the, the West may offer a solution there because you need much less input. Um, showing some examples from clinical trials and preclinical trials um, um, from, from our own work. So this was a clinical trial that took place in 2006. There was no West system then, so the regular Western blot was, was done. And this was a local treatment, so local intramuscular proof of concept. We did this only once for exon 51 skipping, and after that, everything was, was done systemically, but this was really the first in man and therefore the local treatment was, was done. And then a biopsy was taken one month after treatment. Um, and for your reference, on the top right, the healthy controls on the bottom right, Duchenne, and then after treatment, you really see that dystrophin is restored in each of the four patients that were included in this trial. But you also see, if you look, for instance, at patient three, um, you see there's areas where there's no dystrophin. And these were the areas where there's a lot of fibrosis. And you don't expect dystrophin to be restored there because fibrotic tissue doesn't express dystrophin transcripts. But this is something to bear in mind, and we'll get back to that as well. Um, so on the top here, you see the relative 
quantification, so how many fibers are dystrophin positive, what was the relative expression, but this is immune fluorescence, so that's not very quantitative. On the bottom you see the Western blot, this was the hand cast Western blotting system, um, not very quantitative, but it confirmed that dystrophin was restored, and of course now we have more sophisticated systems to measure this, uh, but this really was the first proof of concept that dystrophin could be restored after axon skipping. Um, so these are some dystrophin levels um, from our animal models, our preclinical studies in, in the MDX mouse. And I'm showing you this picture to really outline how low the amount of dystrophin are that we sometimes have. So less than 1%, around 2%. And that's really, if you do the hand cast Western blots, it's difficult because what well, we can measure, we can see that there's there's dystrophin, while in the MDX, usually uh, before treatment, we don't see any dystrophin. So we can see that there's dystrophin, but it's really difficult whether it's 1%, 1 1.5, 0.5, etc. That is very difficult, and you can see the error bars here. Um, so also some, some uh, WES uh, examples. So this is the uh, uh, dilution series that you can see um, in a wild-type mouse. And then also on the next slide, um, the, the treated mice where we can much more robustly detect these very small uh, uh, amounts of dystrophin. And also what you can see, um, so for whatever reason, and don't ask me because I don't know why, but for whatever reason, the dystrophin size in the West system is always around 200 and something kilodalton. Well, of course, we know it's 427 um, in real life, but we're sure that this is the dystrophin because this is the band that disappears um, both in mouse and human in patients um, compared to the healthy control. So it's the right band. It's just for whatever reason, uh, it, it gives the wrong size. So we see that the distribution uh, will influence um, how well, what the dystrophin restoration is like, and already you can see, well, 10% can mean different things. Um, but another consideration is that different patients will have different dystrophin after the treatment. Um, we already discussed the difference between the microdystrophin and the dystrophin that you get after axon skipping and genome editing. Um, the dystrophins after actual skipping and genome editing are often dystrophins where we know that they're functional because we see them in Becker patients. So literally patients are walking around with these dystrophins. For the microdystrophins, um, that's not the case. These are only induced in patients so far, and so we, we, we still have to see how functional they are. However, if we look at axon skipping, the dystrophin levels that are produced are very low. They're in the order of one percent. Well, with microdystrophin, the amounts that we produce are much higher. And so you have to see which domains are present, and also this phasing of the repeat that I mentioned already. With the microdystrophin, you can tailor, you can engineer that repeat one and two, and for instance, uh, uh, 23, 24, that they fit nicely. With um, uh, genome editing and exoskipping, you rely on what is in frame, and it's possible that these uh, repeats don't fit properly. For instance, you have the first third of repeat one connected um, to the last fourth of repeat two, and then that may not be as functional um, as when you have this proper phasing. Um, what we know is that this functionality is more of an issue in heart than it is in skeletal muscle. So there's some dystrophins that seem to be very functional in skeletal muscle, but where Becker patients have primarily cardiomyopathy. Um, so then the dystrophin amount that, that, that patients produce, so how much do they produce? I mentioned already for Becker patients, um, it doesn't matter whether you have 20% or 80%. However, for Duchenne patients, the dystrophin amounts that we're restoring now and axon skipping, we're still in a linear range where more is expected to be better. So we know there's a certain threshold where it doesn't matter that you have more or less, but below that threshold, more dystrophin will be more functional. And that's the, say, the sweet spot we're in with axon skipping at the moment. So to answer the question, so how much dystrophin do you need and how much do you need for what? Uh, we use a trick of random axon activation and I mentioned already the dystrophin gene is located on the X chromosome, so female carriers will have 50% of dystrophin because in half their cells, the, 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 the healthy um, 
dystrophin uh, chromosome is active, and in half their cells, the, the mutated chromosome is active. This actin activation um, takes place when the cells are in about a 100 uh, cell state, so in the embryo, and then each cell individually determines whether to um, inactivate the X chromosome from the father or the mother, but that pattern is then um, inherited by each of the mother cell, uh, daughter cells. So we know 50% is enough. Uh, most carriers do not have symptoms. But when you uh, use a model that has skewed axon activation, so that preferentially inactivated, what you can do is crossing this skewed axon activation model with normal dystrophin to an MDX mouse. If you do that, the carriers will preferentially inactivate the chromosome that has the normal copy of dystrophin. So they will have lower amounts of dystrophin and how much that will um, uh, differ for each of the different mice. Um, so we've done this. And again, this was before we had the West system. Um, and we, we did uh, uh, we did this in the regular MDX mouse, we did this in the double knockout mouse, which is more severely affected. We did several uh, studies, and we literally, we've had to do Western blotting with hand cast gels in hundreds of different, uh, for hundreds of different samples, also doing uh, 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 duplicates or triplicates. Um, so, um, again, this was really a lot of work, and um, well, the people involved. Um, tell me that if they'd had the, the, the West system then, they would have been a lot happier. Um, and they said it, not, not me. Um, so then I mentioned already, we, we did this, well, you can do this in a regular MDX mouse model, and this is what we did, but we also did it in a mouse that also lacks eutrophin. And mice that don't have dystrophin and eutrophin are very severely affected. They generally die before the age of 12. Um, and so this was a model where we could see, well, what, what's the impact of low levels of dystrophin also on survival? And what we did, what we saw when we looked at this mice, and we didn't know the amounts of dystrophin when we looked at the mice, we had to look at it afterwards. So after animals were, were, were um, sacrificed, then we could look how much dystrophin they were making. So what you see at 10 weeks old, um, we have the mouse on the left looking okay, the mouse on the right looking okay. At 14 weeks of age, you can see that the mouse on the right starts to develop kyphosis, so it has this little hump. And at 23 weeks, it's more prominent. And you can also see the muscle weakness. So when you uh, uh, pick up the mice by still, normally it has a reflex where it spreads the legs. You can see the mouse on the right is less able to do that due to muscle weakness. We had to sacrifice the mouse on the right um, due to uh, humane reasons that we pre-specified. The mouse on the left lived beyond the year, and in the end, we had to sacrifice it because it got age-related um, uh, uh, cancers. Um, so it, it never developed a, a dystrophinopathy. So I mentioned already, so we can, we can only see how much dystrophin the mice had after they died. And what we did, we compared it with mice without any dystrophin and no eutrophin. And I mentioned these mice die off before uh, 12 weeks of age. We had one super survivor that lived for five months. So if we look at the five months, so the latest time point that any of the, the double knockout mice were, were still alive, we see that even the mice that made less than 5% dystrophin, about 70% is still alive. And every, all the mice that made more than 5% dystrophin, all of them are still alive at five weeks. And if we then look at 10 months, we see that now the mice that have less than 5% dystrophin, they start dying. Um, they're, they're significantly longer lived than the ones without any dystrophin, but they do start dying. But some are still alive. Um, a few of the mice between 5 and 15% started dying, but those having more than 15%, all were still alive. We also looked at function, and the dark blue is the mice without any dystrophin. The orange is mice um, that have 100% dystrophin, so control mice. Um, and then the, the light blue is mice that have more than 5%, and the dark blue is, say, the middle blue is mice that have less than 5%. And what you can see is that having some dystrophin improves function, not back to normal, but clearly more than mice that have no dystrophin at all. And whether you have more or less than 5% doesn't really seem to matter here. Um, so what we also know is it used to be the case that people say you need 20% dystrophin. What we know now, that is 
not the case. We have seen Becker patients now with uh, Western blot and West system uh, quantified that have less than 10% dystrophin. We've also seen that Duchenne patients that make really low amounts of dystrophin that we couldn't pick up 10 plus years ago because we didn't have sophisticated techniques, we can now pick up that they have really low amounts of dystrophin, order of 1%. They have a slower disease progression, so a later loss of ambulation, and also if you look at um, six-month walk test, North Star, functional output, um, we see that they have a slower disease progression. So what this all tells us is that a little bit can go a long way. However, all these models and these patients have dystrophin from birth. In patients, you intervene later. In the Shen patients, they have no dystrophin or very little dystrophin, and then you start the treatment. Um, and that's, of course, a different case. Um, so what we did, we also did AON treatment, so axon skipping treatment in our double knockout mice um, at very low doses. So again, restoring about 1% to 2% of dystrophin. And what you can see is that the, uh, the models, the mice treated with the AON, have a significantly extended survival. Um, they're not back to normal, um, but the order of magnitude, um, is, I mean, it's clear that there is a treatment effect, um, even with these very low dystrophin restorations. So finally, the time of intervention matters, and well, I was working up to this already a little bit. Um, if we treat earlier, there will be more target tissue. There's less fibrosis yet, so there's more tissue that expresses dystrophin where you can have dystrophin restoration. And also, I mean, even if you would be able to restore dystrophin in fibrosis, um, I mean, the, 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 the tissue doesn't express dystrophin. If you would force their expression, then suddenly the fibrosis would not go back to being muscle. So once muscle tissue is lost, it's irreversibly lost. And probably for each muscle, there's this point of no return. Even if we restore dystrophin, the damage is done and you will lose that function. So the bottom line, the earlier you treat, the larger the therapeutic effect is expected to be. Um, finally, something about axon skipping. I mentioned already there's four axon skipping drugs approved at the moment. It's a mutation-specific approach, and um, you really restore very low levels of dystrophin with these approaches. And what still needs to be done is to show functional effects due to these low levels of dystrophin. And there's an applicability uh, bottleneck, and that's more clear in this slide. So XL51 skipping applies to 14% of patients. So if you have, um, uh, uh, if you want to do your clinical trial, this is still possible. I mean, it's a rare disease, but 14% of patients for one of the most common rare diseases, that is still doable. But then you see that the numbers go down quickly. So 9% for 45 8% for 53, and then, for instance, if you look at, at, at 50 and 43, uh, it's, it's 4 and 3%. So that makes doing these clinical trials really challenging. And another challenge is that, well, there's now these drugs approved, but it's clear that there's room for improvement. So at the moment for 51 skipping, for instance, it's not just the confirmatory studies that are ongoing to show that, indeed, this approved compound is effective, there's also new and improved um, AONs for exon 51 skipping that are tested in parallel in clinical trials. And then suddenly you have your 14%, but you have to divide it in really small groups. So the challenge is um, once we start doing this for more and more and more exons, at some point it won't be possible to show in a large group that there's a slower disease progression because there's simply not enough patients. So what we really need to do as a field is to establish the correlation and knowing that you need this amount of dystrophin and then we know that down the line there will be a functional effect because then dystrophin restoration would be a good surrogate marker um, also for these smaller groups where you have maybe 10 or 20 patients worldwide. And this is the case for exon skipping, but maybe the same will apply in the future for genome editing. So in summary, um, there's many aspects that influence how much dystrophin is needed to have therapeutic effects in Duchenne patients. And it's really important to measure dystrophin restoration approaches in clinical trials to confirm target engagement, to confirm that the, 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 the approach works as um, a plan, but also preclinically if you want to improve on axon skipping to see 
well, this was our reference compound. This is the improved. Do we indeed see an, an increase? Um, and likely um, for the more rare mutation disrupt in restoration uh, um, um, assessment will be even more important because then showing function will be much more difficult due to the small group size. Um, finally, I would like to thank all the funders that have funded us throughout the years and also the group. Um, and I, I, um, I made the, the people that were really heavily involved in some of the work that I showed you here, I made the, 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 uh, the, their names bold. Um, but also thanking our collaborators at the, 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 the Department of Neurology because they obtained samples from, from the Shannon Becker patients for further studying and the people at Procenta Biomarin who really did a lot of work in optimizing and standardizing the dystrophin quantification uh, processes. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions uh, in the time that is left. All right, thank you, Dr. Artsmaras, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, so it looks like we do have some questions coming in. Um, the first question that I see is, how does delivery such as localization to skeletal muscle versus other tissues affect the potency of the treatment strategies that you described? Well, I think the um, um, it, it, skeletal muscle is one of the most difficult tissues to reach. Um, First, because uh, muscle is very abundant, so about 30 to 40 percent of, of our body is muscle, and then it's not you're not treating one big organ, you're treating muscles that are well distributed over 700 larger and smaller muscles throughout the body, um, and then the muscle has really dense endothelium, so it's really difficult to to reach, and I think that is how the AAV viral vectors manages to, to deliver to, to skeletal muscle, but bear in mind uh, the, the brunt of what you inject goes to liver. Um, and the same goes for the axle skipping compound. They go to, to muscle a little bit, but a lot uh, goes to kidney and is also cleared via the urine. So I think that is that the challenge is that muscle is a challenging tissue to, to deliver. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, our second question is, what challenges remain with respect to quantifying dystrophin? Um, I think, well, I think the, 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 the challenge is that we have our dystrophin restoring um, approaches, uh, mm. but they, they restore very low levels of dystrophin. So to sensitively and robustly measure these really low amounts of dystrophin, that is a challenge. Um, and of course, well, we can say, so we need better techniques, but I think the bottom line is we need better drugs because we need to, to restore higher amounts of dystrophin because then also there would be more of a therapeutic effect. And I think ideally we would want to be able to measure dystrophin. We want to, to measure everything at once, like seeing the, the location, seeing the, uh, uh, the, um, the abundance, seeing uh, uh, the size. I don't think that is possible with current techniques, but I think if you use both a Western or capillary Western and the, the, the immune fluorescence, then you can, you can know what you need to know. And I think I mentioned already, um, if the, the open biopsy could be replaced by a needle biopsy, that would also be a big improvement because that's a lot less invasive. However, um, it's really important to make sure that if you do a biopsy, that that biopsy can be used. So patients prefer to have an open biopsy than having a needle biopsy that then is, is not usable for, for analysis. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Um, okay, the next question is, where is the industry evolving the fastest? And what advancements do you envision having the largest near-term impact on the field of muscular dystrophy research? Yeah. So I think currently what's clear is that we need to find ways to improve the delivery of axle skipping compounds or whatever compounds to muscle. Um, so that can be um, better uptake of AAVs to muscle so we can use lower doses that are less toxic, 
or better uptake of the actual skipping compounds by um, by muscle. I think if we would manage that, that would well benefit not just Duchenne but the whole muscular dystrophy field. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of research ongoing there. For instance, um, uh, conjugating antibodies to um, oligonucleotides and 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 well, optimizing the 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 gene therapy approaches. Um, yeah. So that is. Uh, uh, I think that is where most of the work is now, and if people manage to achieve that, then that will have an impact on on, on the whole muscular dystrophy field. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, thank you. Our, our next question is, do the trace amounts vary by uh, myonuclear domain as you move through cross-sections? Um, so I don't really know whether the trace amounts vary. Uh, I don't think mm -hmm. we, we really looked into that. We do see, I mean, per um, myofiber, you see that there's different intensity, if you will, of the dystrophin. And also, mm -hmm. even across the myofiber, there's different intensity. So I think the answer there would be yes. Um, what we also did with our um, exon activation model, of course, we had some of these mice that had about 5% dystrophin expression. We looked longitudinally, and then you really see very nicely the myonuclear domain, um, because you see that around the, the nucleus that apparently can express dystrophin, you see dystrophin restoration, but you also see that it's very limited. And I think there was a recent paper in, 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 in uh, PNAS um, about the myonuclear domain that really showed that dystrophin does not travel far from its nucleus, sadly. Okay, yes. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, how do we quantify microdystrophin or a mini dystrophin using WB? Uh, do we have specific antibodies or the, uh, for these, or do we need to use dystrophin antibody itself? So, well, both is possible um, because of the size. You know the mm. size of the microdystrophin and you know the size of, of mini dystrophin. So, because you know this, um, if you use the C terminal antibody, um, and well, of course, the C terminal domain will always be in this micro and mini dystrophins because it's crucial for connection to the extracellular matrix. If you use yeah. that antibody, you will see your microdystrophin. So, you can use that. Um, and I know that for some of the microdystrophin, the companies are trying to make, say, a microdystrophin specific antibody that specifically binds to, well, a unique domain like spectrin uh, uh, repeat number uh, two into spectrin repeat number 16 that's not present in, in regular um, dystrophin, but is present in the microdystrophin. They're trying to make the, the microdystrophin specific antibodies. Um, but it, it's not really needed because the C-terminal antibody will work as well. And especially with the microdystrophin and the minidystrophin, you know exactly the size that they should be. Um, and you probably have your plasmid that you, 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 you use to make your, your mini and microdystrophin construct. You can also use that um, uh, production from that as a, as a reference if you need to. Okay, wonderful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, well, you're being thanked for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> I agree. Uh, when do you think a better treatment can be available for, for patients? So, yeah, so I, I would like to say soon, but I think what, 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 what I've learned from well, being in the field now for 23 years is mm -hmm. that um, doing clinical research and preclinical research is difficult. And I think what we've shown now is that the trick works. We can restore these, these dystrophins, um, but it needs to be better. And then trying to make things better generally uses new approaches that have not been tested before in humans. And then we don't know whether they will work in humans and we don't know whether they will be safe in humans. We've seen already a couple of, of, of approaches that looked really promising in mice. And then in humans, either they were not effective or um, they were toxic. So um, we really will have to wait for the results of the clinical trials. And with each clinical trial, yeah, you, there, there's a chance that it works, but there's also a chance that it doesn't work. Um, so I don't want to, to make any predictions because, the, yeah, well, it, it's not under my control. If it was under my control, it would be really soon, but sadly mm -hmm. it, it's not. We have to wait for the, the results of the trials and to see how, how these compounds, these new compounds behave. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, all right, looks like we have one time for one more question today. So 
Uh, the last question is, uh, what about dystrophin restoration in the dia uh, diaphragm, muscle that is usually poorly translated by AAV? Is the threshold of dystrophin different to restore its function than for skeletal muscle or the heart? So I don't think the threshold will be different. I think the challenge is that um, it's generally more severely affected. Um, so that means that, so maybe you will restore 5% dystrophin in the diaphragm, but if 50% of the diaphragm is already fibrotic, for instance, um, then that 5% is less than if you have a muscle that's completely healthy. Um, so I think that, that will probably play a role. Um, but also there we'll have to wait and see. And I think what's also good to bear in mind because people focus a lot on the diaphragm, but you don't only breathe with your diaphragm. Your intercostal muscle also help you to, to, to breathe. So hopefully these are better preserved and they can also help with, with, with improving respiratory function or slowing down respiratory function. Um, but yeah, again, also here, I, 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 I'm speculating now and I don't have a magic number for you to, to, to say how much you would need there. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you so much again, Dr. Asmaras, for your time today and for your important research. Uh, do you have any final comments for the audience today? No, well, if they if they come up with any questions, I'm sure they can uh, Google Sherlock, my my uh, email address. They they are free to to email me any questions that that they come up with later. But usually, what happens to me is that I need some time to process, and then I come up with questions. So, feel free to to ask me questions via email if you have any uh, questions. And I hope that the 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 talk was useful for people. Oh, absolutely. And thank you again, Dr. Asmaras. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Biotechne, for underwriting today's educational webcast. If interested, please visit bio-techne.com to learn more about how Simple Western provides quantitative protein measurements in a reproducible and fully automated format, improving your data qu quality from as little as three microliters of sample in just three hours. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live events. Until next time, take care, everybody, and goodbye.